So welcome um, to Job Search for Social Workers. So I understand you are all MSW students. Who is a first year MSW student? Okay, half second years? All right, so pretty even spread. This is, it'll be good. Um, I will definitely say, so we'll be going through this presentation, which will focus on a couple of different things that we encourage you to be thinking about as you prepare for a job search, whether it be looking for you know, an internship experience, um, another clinical, or for those of you who may be graduating either in December or this coming May, that um, ever fun full-time job search. Um, I'm also the type of presenter, if you have questions, please feel free to raise your hand. I'd rather discuss them during the presentation than at the end, uh, mostly because we always end up running out of time at the end to have answer any questions. Um, I will be available at the end for just a few quick questions, um, but you never know who you might be helping if you ask your question um, to the group. So I definitely recommend, just feel free to raise your hand um, and I will call on you. So. Um, things that we're going to be discussing today, um, threefold. It's resume best practices, interview fundamentals, and then general job search strategies um, that you can implement as you begin your search for different types um, of opportunities. All of these things definitely play a very large role in the job search, um, especially for social work students. But these are things that you can have, may have been doing throughout your professional career even before you came into this degree program. So first and foremost, resume best practices. You obviously need a resume in order to apply for any of the jobs and internships that you're going to be interested in. So we want to make sure that we've got it as great as it, it can be. And we'll go over some of the things that we encourage you to think about. Um, first and foremost, you know, the purpose of a resume. It's really for personal marketing. It is an outline of your professional um, in some cases, personal, academic experiences that are going to explain to an employer why you are the best fit for the job that you're going to be applying for. Obviously, your resume is only about you. It's not about anybody else. Um, so we wanted to focus on your personal experiences throughout the length of your academic and professional careers. It's to show relevant strengths, skills, and accomplishments. Goes back to that personal marketing piece. It is all about what you can bring to the table in terms of what the employer is asking for. This is where it becomes very important to become familiar with the different types of positions that you're going to be applying to um, because all of those strengths, skills, and accomplishments can vary depending on the types of opportunities, the types of organizations you're gonna be looking to apply for. Um, a hospital, say if you're going to be looking for a social work position within a hospital, is maybe going to be something very different than with, within a private organization. There are gonna be different types of criteria that they'll be evaluating um, on. So that word relevant will become very, very important as we talk about your resume. And then finally, and the numbering always does this, it's to get an interview. Um, most students think that their resume and the, their cover letter is the most important thing um, in the job search process, and that's true to a certain extent, but a resume and a cover letter is not going to get you a job. It's going to get you an interview. And the interview is what's going to be your ability to introduce yourself to the employer and make a case um, for yourself. So it's really that first introductory step you are putting yourself out there for so that you can get an interview and hopefully then have one more opportunity to prove why you're the best candidate for the position. So pretty general, appearance is important. Um, and especially when we're dealing with master's level um, students, the question is always how many pages, how long can it be, what do I do with all of these things. This is the time where you really start thinking about because you've chosen to pursue an MSW degree, in many cases you've chosen your career path. Many of you won't stray from this, you're going to pursue on to become professional social workers and work in, the, in this particular industry. So some of the things that you may have done previously, maybe you know you worked for four or five years as like an administrative assistant, but you did that because you knew you needed to pay down student loans, it wasn't really what your calling was going to be. And you've now enrolled in the MSW program here at NYU, and you might want to reorganize some of those things where that administrative assistant position may have been very prominent on your resume, but it's not necessarily going to be the most defining thing as you're in this program and as you're choosing other experiences that may match the fact that you want to be working in um, social work. So we can definitely help you get it down to one page, if that's the question. In some cases, you can have a two-page resume. Master students are really the only ones I even allow to think about having a two-page resume, because in many cases, you may have done things in your undergraduate work, in your professional experiences before coming into this program, extracurricular leadership that warrant two pages, because everything's going to be relevant to what it is that you're doing. So it's really a case-by-case 
basis, but if you're gonna have two pages, everything on there is going to have to be relevant because if we see something on it that's not necessarily, I'm gonna ask you, well, how does this qualify you to be a good social worker or qualify you for the positions um, that you're applying for? Um, ways that you can do that, obviously adjusting margins, font sizes, and then making it look visually appealing because most employers will only spend about 30 to 60 seconds on a resume, which is not a lot of time at all. But when you have 100, 200, 300 in front of you from a multitude of positions, that time adds up. So you want to make sure that you're putting all of the information on your resume in a really easily identifiable way. So position titles, um, the name of NYU, organizations that you've worked for, using things like bullets in order to kind of draw attention to the most important things about you and how your relevant skill set will apply to those positions. So resume example, just very quickly, this is one with no formatting. Um, this, you know, can be, you can definitely read through it, but you'll see that it probably takes a lot of time because there's no, you know, kind of standout formatting um, in this. There's no really easy way for an employer to identify what are the most salient things that they're looking for, keywords, bolding, things like that. Where here, a little bit easier to read. You see some of the, you know, the student's name jumps off right off the page, so I know whose resume I'm looking at, their educational experiences. Um, you know, whatever professional work they may have done. The fact that they've got a skill set, um, skill section on there talks about their computer and language proficiency. So it's a lot easier to read that instantaneously I get a better impression of this student because I'm able to pick out really salient facts very quickly and then can focus on some of the other details and then evaluating whether or not they're going to be a student that we're going to want to call in for an interview. Really important things to include, this may seem very basic to you, but you would be very surprised about how many students don't include this information on their resumes. Um, make sure we have your first and last name, you know, address, and then most importantly, emails and phone numbers, because we need to be able to contact you in order to hopefully schedule an interview. Yes, I saw a question. Um, I was told not to include uh, full for It's up to you about what you want to do. Obviously, this is your resume, whatever makes you feel safe and comfortable what it is, but we also want to provide some sort of context about where you're applying to. So say if you're a student here who's currently studying um, in New York, but maybe you're originally from California and you want to go back and practice um, and get a license in California to practice, you can put just like a city and a state. So you won't even need to put the identifying um, thing. Same thing, we see it for a lot of our international students um, as well, because most of them will have international educational experiences. We want to show that they're currently in New York, even though that some of their experiences will be international. So it's also a way of providing context for the person reading your resume. But ultimately, do whatever makes you feel safe, do whatever makes you feel comfortable. If you get to the next stage of that process, you will have to give them your information because they'll need that hopefully for like to pay you once you get the job. Um, and then you know they have confidential ways of keeping that information. Um, and just a quick example of different formats of how this can look. Obviously, this is up to you stylistically. However, your resume is developed. Um, sometimes the two lines actually will run your resume into two pages. Easiest way: put it all in one line. Play around with the formatting and things like that. I'm also hoping this goes without saying, but once again, you would be surprised about how many students who just entered master's programs um, and even entered NYU don't put NYU on their resume. Um, we'll just forget until we tell them to do that. Um, you wanna make sure that you're including things in reverse um, chronological order. So the most recent thing first. So the fact that you are now all currently enrolled students at NYU and or maybe have been for the past year, New York University and the Silver School of Social Work, first and foremost, um, on your resume. One question that we do get from here is where does the education section go? My recommendation to students, and I will tell you this is purely subjective based on the students I work with and my coaching preferences, is that you are a full-time student in, in most cases. Um, so this is your main responsibility. Everything you're doing either in clinicals or internships, extracurricularly, is going to be secondary to the fact that you are pursuing this degree. So for the time being, while you're in this program, I encourage students to have the education section first and then everything else underneath it. Um, I was like that when I was pursuing my master's degree. Um, now that I've been working um, and have completed the degree two years ago, it's at the bottom of my resume because my professional experiences that I've been doing over the past three, four years um, are more relevant when I'm either applying for jobs or you know networking or things 
um, like that. But make sure you're including, obviously, the name of the school. It's really important for um, Silver students because of the identification of the school and the program um, that, you're, that you're in. Some of our like GSIS students won't put Graduate School of Arts and Sciences because there's 54 degree programs there. Silver, obviously not as many as 54, and for some organizations, Silver actually might be more recognizable as a school of social work than NYU as a total school. So the combination of both of those things is very important. Um, yes? You can, depending on the type of scholarship that you've received. Um, we never encourage you to put the amount of it, but you can put like a small um, section underneath it that says like honors and awards, and you can say recipient of XYZ scholarship um, for duration of program. So it really depends on kind of how you want to highlight those things, but it's definitely something you can add. Yes? This is just an example. So this would be like sometimes what students will do. We see this with our nursing students a lot. You can do this in one of two ways. Um, some students will put it in their education section. Other students will have a, cert a separate certifications section. So we see this a lot with our nursing students as well. Whenever you decide to take whatever credentialing you may need, or say if you're taking additional certification programs, you can do a separate certification um, section on it. It really just depends on how you want to kind of highlight those things because ultimately in order to be professionals in your field, you need to be licensed. Um, so what I sometimes also recommend is that after you've completed your degree and taken the licensing and, and passed and done all of that um, stuff, actually the first thing on your resume underneath your contact information will be a certifications and licensures section because you won't even be considered for any of the positions that you're probably applying for without that license information. So that's why I say first and foremost, most important thing on your resume, and then we go into the rest of it. Does that make sense? Yes. Hand. Yeah. So our stance is when you are, master's programs are a little bit different because usually there's not as much of a requirement placed on it. I will tell you from my master's, I don't have um, a, GPA, a GPA on my resume, but I, do have, I did have my undergrad for a very long time. It's up to you, you know, unless they give you a compelling reason about why it's not, I wouldn't say that you can kind of make a, a bold blanket statement on it. If it's a 3.0 or above, I mean, are they like discriminating against you because they're on it? Because if it's, you know, a 3.0, Six seven, which is what's in the example here, it's not. A, it's obviously a wonderful GPA. It shows that you've you know worked very hard academically. But if they're not using it, I mean, what, why did they tell you that they didn't want to see it? So it really depends on to whom you're applying to. Obviously, different industries are different. If you want to leave it off, they, are, they might eventually ask you for it, and you can give them the information. So if that's the feedback that you're getting, then I would say you can definitely leave it off. We've heard from other employers, um, especially for some of them who have to use some sort of weaning process, depending on how competitive the job may be, that that's one way that they evaluate um, you. Our stance as the Wasserman Center is if your GPA is a 3.0 or above, we encourage you just to put it on your resume because it's just getting that information out of the way. As long as it's not you know, you know, hindering your application, whether or not they don't want to look at it because it's not relevant to them, well, my kind of response to them would be then just skip it and go look at what you want to look at. Um, because to me, if there's not anything that's like really coming down to why you're not, you know, if you're, that, if, unless it would be really hurting you in a way, you know, it's kind of just getting that information out because they may ask to see an official transcript. They're going to see your, you know, yeah. GPA there anyway. So do whatever. I mean, if you're feeling, getting feedback saying that it doesn't matter, then that's actually wonderful because then they know you're kind of evaluating you on the, on the skill set that you're bringing in. Um, but we think, you know, your skill set sometimes comes from the strength of a GPA because you guys are learning the skills that you're going to be using in the professional environment. Not to say that a high GPA correlates to someone who's excellent in the field, that isn't you know, a, a blanket case, but if you're doing well academically, it means you're getting what we're teaching you here, and you're then practically applying that in the way we're assessing you as a higher education institution. So not the best answer that I can give you, but it sounds like you may not necessarily need to have it on there if, you know, if it's not necessarily meaningful for the opportunities you're specifically looking at. 
Yes. Sure. You're continuing on, you picked up this degree along the way. Yeah. Do you still want to highlight it up front, or you want your experience to be up front and this to be? I think it goes back to what I said previously. I think in this case, because you are picking it up right now, we want to show because you may because you may not be working full time, because the experiences you'll be getting while you're in this program are going to be short term, and obviously we might see what your undergrad is going to be. There's going to be a big maybe potential gap in between the undergrad and when you did um, a master's degree. And then in the experience sections, we'll see maybe there's semester long opportunities or maybe it's a year long practicum. We want to provide some. Um, you know, kind of context to say the reason why these experiences are kind of like odd looking in terms of maybe I had another five year position is because I'm currently a student. So that's obviously my full time responsibility. I would say after you finish the degree and land that first internship, then you can probably put it at the end, especially if all the other stuff you're doing will be relevant to your longer term professional goals. Um, once again, so then we move on to experience, which is really going to be the bulk of what is on um, your resume. So this can include part-time work, full-time jobs that you may have held, jobs, internships, volunteer work, different field work experiences that you may have, and you wanna make sure that you're including your position title, the organization that you worked for, how long you um, were a part of that organization, and the location. And then obviously you wanna go into the description section talking about key things that you are responsible for and what some of your accomplishments and achievements were. So. Some of the examples, obviously not social work related, but you know, marketing intern, for example. Um, you know, include relevant tasks and achievements here. See next pages for more information. So some of the things, hopefully everybody is familiar with action and result format. So action is the what, the where, the when, the who that you might have been working with. So what you were actually doing. And the result is the outcome. What is the achievement? What was the goal of that particular project? Because we're gonna hope that in all of the experiences that you have, you aren't just given tasks to like keep you busy. That it's going to be something that's going to help you develop your skill set as a social work professional and contribute to the office, contribute to the field, um, and really kind of have some value that you can then say, I learned how to do this because of this field work, which means that for this next job I'm applying for, I feel confident in this skill set and I'll be able to apply it in your organization with your patients, whatever it may be. So, before, the help patients, the after. Ooh. Collaborate with multidisciplinary hospital and medical personnel to implement patient care plans. Now, which student's resume do you think you would want to hire, the before or the after? And also, too, because here, the help patients, it's really subjective. How are you helping them? What are you doing um, with them, for them? And obviously, too, based on every different experience that you'll have, how you provide that type of care may be different. So you want to be very descriptive in how you're providing care because what you do in a hospital may be very different than what you do in a private setting or in a personal care situation. So this is your ability to provide some details so that even if I'm not 100% familiar with the type of facility you may be working in, I'm going to be familiar with the type of care that you're providing for your patients. So optional resume content, just some things that you can put in. None of these things are mandatory, um, but things that we think about um, that you can potentially add. I will definitely say profile summaries, objectives, I'm not a big fan of. Mostly for the fact um, that this is a very subjective section. Profile summary objectives, if you've got a LinkedIn profile, great place to put it. On your resume, 90% of the goal is going to be for you to either find a fieldwork experience or a job. And when you submit applications for that, that's why we know that you're receiving them. The one place where this can be a little bit different is if you are a career changer. So say if you've worked in one field for very many years and have now decided that social work is your passion, you've come back to pursue an advanced degree in that and get the certification that you need. Sometimes the summary section is actually um, a good way to describe that saying you've had five to 10 years of experience in another field but have now transitioned into social work and identifying some of the core proficiencies that you're bringing from one field into the other because your resume is going to look a lot different than a student who may have you know a bs in social work and an msw as opposed to someone who may have gone an art history degree worked as a museum curator for 10 15 years but now has decided that they want to come be um, a social worker so you want to provide once again some context about where you're coming from and where the skill set you do have at this point has been developed so skills are actually really important to kind of put on here. Um, 
technical skills, social media, language, all of these things um, are actually really important for students um, who are applying to these types of things um, now, regardless of whether, what industry you're going into, because all of these things actually matter in terms of professional development. Everybody's concerned about you know, technical skills, social media, um, language skills, because there's such potentially a diverse patient pool that you'll be working with too. So indicating where your different skill sets in within the language environment is also really important. So a couple of different ways that you can feasibly do this. Interests, I always like interests, mostly because at the end of the day, we're hiring people. And I know sometimes, you know, it can feel like you're sending out your resume and it looks the same as everybody else's, especially when you're going into such a specific type of field that most, a lot of the experiences you all are going to have are going to be a little bit similar. So interests is a good way for you to be able to kind of show a little bit of your own personality. Because at the end of the day, too, is you guys, and you, I'm sure those of you who have done field work or have been doing other internships know that you connect with your patients and the people that you work with on more than just a like patient care you know, process. It's not just explaining to them about what types of treatments you'll be doing or how they're going to be you know, getting better, how you're going to be counseling them. Sometimes you talk about some of these interests in there to harbor and make that connection with someone. And so we actually consider this a really interesting thing to put on your resume because it's a good talking point for someone to maybe get to know you a little bit better. And if they feel a connection to you, sometimes that's actually more important than being the most qualified person in the room because you could look great on paper, but you could be like a meh person. And when I feel a connection to a person, because I'm a person hiring, it tends to make me want to feel like I'm willing to invest and risk in hiring that particular person because I feel something positive about them as opposed to someone who may look stellar on paper, but like isn't going to be nice to patients. So kind of interesting thing to include there. And then just a couple of different ways that you can do this. You can do interests separately, skills and interests together, depending on you know, how long um, of your resume you have. So any questions about resumes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so coursework is definitely something that you can include. It depends on what type of coursework you're doing, what you, the goal of those academic projects were. You know, students will sometimes list courses that they've taken. I'm sometimes not a big proponent of those things because it doesn't tell me what you've learned in the course. Um, if you are doing, say if you have to put together like um, a tentative patient care plan and then present it to the faculty member, um, that's something that you can talk a little bit more in depth um, on because that especially if you maybe aren't doing as many external experiences, that stuff in the classroom is gonna become even more important because that's gonna show how you've developed the skill set and at least practiced it, even if you haven't maybe executed it in a certain way. All right, so interview fundamentals. Everybody's favorite thing, the interview. So purpose of an interview, once again, threefold. Um, is to exchange information, and this is a two-way street. So it's for you to continue telling the employer or interviewer about yourself and your experiences, and it's for you to also learn about the organization and find out how they work, what their values are, how they provide patient care, um, and figure out whether or not you know, it's a place that you want to be. Marketing your skills goes back to that exchanging information. Um, this is the opportunity for you to talk in a lot more detail, hopefully, than what's written on a resume and a cover letter. So you actually get to use full sentences, words, examples, as opposed to maybe some brief phrases um, from a resume. And then probably most importantly, and really important for social workers, because of the commitment that you guys have to your industry, not every place that you think you're going to want to work is going to be a good fit for you. So the interview is really the ability for you to find out if that facility, if that institution is going to be able to support you as a professional in the way that you need to do it, because obviously we see social workers go through a lot of ups and downs due to the connection that you make with the people that you're working with, and it can be really tough. Um, at times, especially when you have a hard case. So you want to be able to understand if the institution you're then going to go work with is going to be able to support you both through those highs, but also through those lows. Um, same thing with like work-life balance. You know, this is the opportunity to ask those questions because you will spend more time with these people at work than you will with anybody else in your life. So you want to make sure that this is a good opportunity and a place that's going to support you in the place that you are. Yes.
They were mean to the intern. Yeah, I mean, it's, you're never going to be 100% sure of any experience because you never really learn what it's like to work in a place until you start working there, so it means you've been hired. You have to ask good questions. I mean, you have to try to do some research on their website doing look, and looking at things at like Glassdoor, um, which is great. They do a lot of different reviews on that. And then it's really asking, you know, you would say, you can ask the person straight outright, what do you like most about your job? What do you not like about your job? What are some of the challenges that you face working in this environment? How is work-life balance supported? Um, how would you describe the company culture? Ultimately, you also need to trust yourself and your gut and kind of say, you know, it's not just about them evaluating you, it's about you evaluating them. And I have always been a very large proponent, if, if you don't feel comfortable, it's not going to be a good place for you, no matter how great the experience may look on paper. Same thing for like that interview thing. You may be a stellar candidate on paper, but you may be like an eh candidate. So you have to ask the hard, the hard questions, and they should be forthcoming with that information. If you feel like they're pulling back or not being genuine with you, and the good thing about being a social worker, I feel like, is sometimes you guys have a very good understanding of people and have very good intuition um, about reading people. Use that. Use that to your advantage. Use it in the way that you would you know, work with your patients. If something feels off to you about a patient, you're going to try to figure out what's wrong with that situation, figure out what's not working there. It's the same thing with interviewing. So if you ever have specific questions about a specific organization, that's when we recommend you come in and talk to us because then we can help you kind of tailor some of those questions because you want them to be specific to that environment. Yes? Can you just repeat, um, you mentioned something about Glassware? Yeah, Glassdoor. Glassdoor.com is a great website um, where you can plug in different like keywords. Um, so you can type, plug in names of organizations, you can plug in social worker and find out what it's like to be in that specific field. Um, and then they'll tell you, like say if you're applying to NYU Langone as a social worker, there will be potentially people who've commented on what it's like to work at NYU Langone as a social worker. We're hoping those reviews are gonna be positive. Um, some of them may not have been, but that's also a good indication of what people are saying who have worked there at one point. Some of those things may still be valid, may have changed, but you can kind of get at least a sense. Is it only nonprofits though? No, 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 yeah, no, it's everybody. If you were to like Google like Morgan Stanley, you know, financial institutions, consulting firms, nonprofits, it runs the whole gamut um, of stuff. So preparing for the interview. A um, couple of different components that you really want to pay attention to is first of all, researching. Um, being prepared for the interview is actually more important in some cases than going on the interview itself. Because once the interview starts, there's nothing you can do about it. You can only, you can't continue preparing in the middle of it. You have to kind of be ready to go before it even gets started. So you want to make sure that you know the job and the industry that you're applying for. So read the job description, especially if you're going to be applying to a lot of different opportunities. We're hoping you're going to be getting a lot of different callbacks. So you want to stay organized so that you aren't, you know, if you're interviewing at NYU Langone, um, but that you've also got another one at, you know, Columbia um, Medical Center, that you're not mixing up the different jobs and interviewing for the wrong position at the wrong, at the wrong time. Also, knowing what's happening within the social work industry as a whole is also really important. A good example that I give for the industry that I work in, obviously I work here at NYU. We are getting a new president in January. Um, while that doesn't necessarily affect my day-to-day -day life right now, it would be really bad for me not to know that I'm basically getting a brand new boss um, who then trickles down, will make, maybe make decisions about how the Wasserman Center does its programming, how we interact with students, what our priorities are. So the same thing can be said about social work. You want to find out what are the different types of, is there anything different happening in patient care? Are there facilities that are merging? Are there new credentialing and certifications that you need to be getting as a professional? Because eventually too, remember that this interview process probably will not stop. The first job that you get out of graduating from this program will not unfortunately be the last. Um, if it is, that's wonderful. But still, you want to make sure that you're keeping up to date as a professional so that if you're going for promotions and you're looking for career advancement, knowing what's happening in the industry is a really good way to be able to kind of position yourself as someone who wants to be a leader in that particular industry. Um, knowing the organization goes back to reading the job description. Make sure you know where you're applying and you know, what are some of the differences between working in one type of facility or another type of facility. Um, and then finally, know yourself. 
comes as a surprise sometimes to students. Know what you wrote on your resume? Um, because sometimes students will just put together a very well-written resume, but will have no ability to articulate the experiences that they um, have on there. So it's more also than just about the clinical experiences that you do. It's going to be things that you may have done um, in your personal extracurricular work. Uh, maybe things that you did in your undergrad that aren't maybe academically relevant anymore, but maybe that's where you learned how to be a good leader, or that's how you learned how to think critically. Um, so make sure that you're able to kind of look at all of your experiences and identify which ones are going to match what the employer is looking for because those are the things that you should be focusing on when you're having that conversation about why you're a good fit for the job. All right. But knowing the details. So what to wear, what to bring, how to get there, what to arrive. If you handle these things before the morning of, will go much smoother, especially maybe if you're going to come to class and then go interview in the afternoon. These are the things we definitely see actually students stress out a little bit more um, about. One of the things always what to wear. We are big proponents of a suit, mostly just because it's like the least thing that you have to worry about. Um, and I have always said that I will never look down upon a student who comes in wearing a full-on suit. Even if you're doing business casual, nice slacks, a skirt, blouse, shirt, tie, whatever the case is, because some people will say, well, social work's a pretty laid back field. All of the people who I intern with or that I work with wear jeans, t-shirts, looks like very comfortable clothing. My answer is, yeah, but you don't work there yet. If you do, and then they say, this is our office culture, and we say, you know, on, you can dress down, we require everybody only to wear a suit, maybe if we've got a big event happening or something like that. When you become a part of that organization, that's when all of those things apply to you. But you, because you want someone to be focusing on what you're saying and what you can bring to the position, I'm never going to say, unless I explicitly tell you, um, and we do have some organizations who will say this, don't come in a suit, like it's not important to us. You still want to look appropriate and professional so that they're not focusing on the fact that maybe you're wearing like a bright orange shirt, but they're more focusing on what clinical experiences you've had and what your commitment is to your patients. Um, what to bring? You don't have to bring a lot. Copies of your resume, definitely. Um, even though you may have submitted it, you never know who you might end up meeting. Um, we've definitely had students go into different facilities and say, you know, they met with a supervisor, but then maybe like, you know, their executive vice president was there and they didn't have another copy. You're going to be that prepared student who can just like take it out of your, your bag with you and say, these are my list of credentials. Really great to meet you. Having a great interview experience. Um, always bring a pen and a piece of paper just in case you may not use it, but sometimes you may want to write down contact information to send thank you notes if there aren't business cards available. Um, and you may want to jot down additional notes, like say if you're still preparing on the way there, or things that you may want to highlight after the interview is, is over. How to get there and when to arrive. Really anxiety producing, especially for students who are interviewing in the New York area. Say if you're you know, interviewing for positions over the next couple of days and say you're going to Midtown. Super fun to be able to get there with all the UN closures and the Pope coming. So you want to be aware of alternative routes, especially if you're interviewing in a place where you are heavily dependent on mass transit, um, because we know how reliable the MTA can be in certain instances. And we don't want it to be their fault that you didn't make it on time because you didn't maybe build in enough time or figure out alternative routes. If you, you know, can't get on the six, maybe you need to get on the NR to get to the same place. When to arrive, also really important. You want to arrive with about 10 to 15 minutes early so that at 10 minutes early you're, you know, you've already introduced yourself to the receptionist or whoever will be greeting you and that you're sitting waiting. That also gives you a little time to use the restroom, um, especially, you know, we see a lot of students interviewing over the colder months. You've got a lot of stuff on you. You want to just pull yourself back together. You want to be as well put together as you were whenever you left your house or your apartment. Um, because you know, you wear those gigantic coats, you like sweat, you're wearing a suit, it's all sort of like, you know, disheveled. So it gives you a little bit of time to really kind of put yourself back together, have that really good professional facade on so that you're ready to go when the interviewer calls you. Um, the other important thing to note is the minute you introduce yourself to whoever greets you, that's when your interview has started. It's not when they bring you into the office or whatever room they'll be interviewing you in, it's when you introduce yourself to the person who's going to let your interviewer know that you are there. And the reason is, is that we have definitely heard horror stories from students who have like snapped at a receptionist. That receptionist might be the most important person in the entire office. And also, why would you want to be mean to someone that you might end up working with? 
because you may have to see that person ultimately. They may ask for feedback from a lot of different people that may not actually be in your interview room, and that may be a make or break, and you may not get a job that you thought you maybe aced the interview, but maybe you were a little snarky to someone in the elevator, and they're like, uh, yeah, no, I don't really think that they're gonna be a good fit, because they kind of rubbed me the wrong way. You'd be surprised how many times that happens. So the minute you enter that building, be, like, be on the ball, because you don't want something as small as that to kind of derail you from what may be a really great opportunity. So during the interview, you want to be aware of a couple of different um, things, including resume presentation. Some people may or may not ask you for your resume. In other places, you know, you may want to be able to hand them a copy. Um, placement of your belongings, you know, it depends on the season. Um, we usually say belongings, you know, next to you in a chair so that you're not, you know, futzing around with them. It's fine if you have like a portfolio or something, you can put it on the table, just make sure you're not um, playing with it. Verbal communication um, and body language kind of go hand in hand um, because employers will definitely start to see, and you guys probably hear I do it a lot, the ums, good thing I'm not interviewing right now, uh, but you definitely want to pay attention to those kinds of ticks. They're not bad, they're not necessarily make or break, but if you know it's something that you may be sensitive to, well, you can come into the Wasserman Center, we can do mock interviews with you, and we can help you identify some of those things that maybe you're not aware of because you're not watching yourself like we would watch you. Um, you also can see I'm a big hand talker. Um, it also depends on how kind of interactive you are. We've definitely had people like do things like this and it gets a little crazy. If you keep it to the end, you're emphasizing a point. You know, in some instances it does, it does work. Um, last one's really important. Show interest and enthusiasm in the facility, programs, and population served. Ultimately, at the end of the day, I want to hire someone who wants to work at my organization. Doesn't matter the fact that you want a job. In many cases, employers actually kind of don't care that you want a job. They want to hire the person who's going to be a best fit to do the things that that organization is committed to doing. So this is where it also becomes important. If you're not 100% sold on the organization, think about whether or not you should be committing to the interview. And we know it's hard to find jobs. I'm not saying that you, you know, should only be choosing the ones that you're like seriously in love with. Um, but you also want to kind of give a, a good thought to if you're like saying, oh, I wouldn't actually take the offer if they gave it to me. Why are you going to be wasting your time and the employer's time by going on an interview that you have absolutely no you know, incentive to take? So by showing that enthusiasm, once again, it goes back to because you want to work there, sometimes that is more meaningful than, the, than your overall skill set. Because in a lot of ways, they can teach you the things that you need to know about their particular facility and their particular you know, patient pool. Um, but you know, I can't teach you how to be a nice person in a lot of instances. So think about those types of things. Answering questions, so two things to remember in here. Um, you want to be relevant and you want to be detailed and specific about your experiences. This is your opportunity to focus on the things about you that matter the most to that position. And this is also the opportunity for you to give really solid, concrete examples of how your skill set has been developed and where you learned how to do these things, more so than you've been able to do in a resume or in a cover letter, because now you've got maybe 30, 45 minutes, an hour to make a case for yourself as opposed to 30 to 60 seconds on your resume. So one of the things that we recommend that students do is using the STAR method. It's a little hokey sounding, but it definitely works. You want to focus on the situation at hand, so giving some context, what you were responsible for, so what the project overall may have been, the actions that you put into place, and then the results. So what was the outcome of those things? What did you achieve? What did you accomplish? Or in some instances, what maybe didn't go right? Or what did you have to reevaluate and what did you learn from that experience? So both on the something you know, went really well on the positive and maybe things didn't necessarily go as planned and you had to acknowledge where some of the changes needed to be done. So an example um, of this, pretty standard, you know, adaptable to kind of most um, industries. Describe a time that demonstrated your leadership ability. So I was given a project once that I was able to take ownership of and felt I was able to impress my bosses with. Kind of blah sounding. The good, last summer during my internship at XYZ Company, I had the opportunity to be the point person for a project amongst our group of three interns. I brought everyone together to divide up the tasks based on each person's strengths and chose a deadline to bring the project together. We were able to pull together a great finished project and our supervisor was able to use it in their meeting with the stakeholders. So you can see here, even in what probably took me, you know, 30 seconds to read out loud, much more detailed and much more kind of, you know, 
relatable to what it is that you're doing, especially because you'll have that job description, because you'll have prepared, you'll then be able to go on and say, okay, these are the credentials that this organization is looking for. What are the examples I'm able to show them that match and show them that, that this is where my skill set comes from? So closing the interview, always want to make sure you do ask questions. This goes back to your initial point. This is where you would ask them about company culture and work fit. Um, and things like that. This is also sometimes a good place to ask about things that maybe came up during the interview. You know, you mentioned that one of the um, types of patients that you work with is this population. I'm really interested in working with that population. Can you tell me if you interact with them at all a little bit or kind of what, how the, the organization works with that? So this is where you also want to be actively listening during the interview because there might be some things that the employer or interviewer will say about the organization or about the job that you're like, oh, that speaks exactly to what I want to be doing, or maybe this is what makes me not want to take this particular position. You can always ask follow-up questions to get a little bit more clarification. Um, so we really expect, I will definitely say a good example, the Wasserman Center, we've been interviewing candidates for positions within our office. I will tell you, we do not hire anybody who doesn't ask us any questions. Doesn't matter how great their interview may have been, if you have nothing to ask us, red flag, especially to a bunch of career counselors, so who are like preparing students to do these types of things. Um, definitely, definitely, definitely ask, what are the next steps? Interviews are hugely anxiety producing, and most students, because they're so relieved to get out of the interview, will forget, when am I supposed to hear back from the employer? You want to ask what are the next steps because that will mean is there going to be maybe a second round interview? Are you going to come back and meet in with maybe some more of the senior leadership? Um, or you know, are there other types of interviews that are going to go on? Or are they going to tell you whether you've been hired within a week? This also, also prompts you if they say you know, you're going to be someone we're going to get back to within a week. Maybe we're still interviewing some other candidates. We expect to let you, you know, everyone know by Friday. Friday comes, Friday goes, the weekend, you haven't heard back, Monday. Monday is when you send a follow-up email and you say, you know, just wanted to follow up on our conversation. I know you indicated you'd be letting candidates know by the end of the week. Just wanted to check in and see if I could get a status update. Short, simple, to the point, professional, but they've given you something. So you now have the ability to kind of go back and say, you know, hi, let me know because I'm sitting here on pins and needles. Thought it went really great. Kind of want to know what the outcome is going to be. Thank you notes. Always write a thank you note. I will tell you um, also, Wasserman example, because it's where I live. Um, we just hired a new executive assistant for our um, executive VP. Part of the reason she got hired is that my boss came in and said she had written one of the best thank you notes she had ever seen. Don't know if she's gonna be any good at her job yet. She's only been here for like a day. Um, but she wrote a really great thank you note. That was what put her above some of the other candidates. Um, you definitely want to send those within 24 to 48 hours. Email is 100% acceptable. Um, snail mail, still really nice. A little outdated at this point just because of the way technology is kind of moving um, along. Um, basically what you would say is, thank you so much for taking the time to meet with me about XYZ position. Um, in there, that's where you want that pen and paper will come in handy. You may want to highlight some of the specific things that you talked about. I really appreciated learning more about your facility and the position. I specifically you know, enjoyed our conversation on this patient care or how you deal with these issues or something like you know, this or learning more about how the organization supports its professionals during times of like busy cases. You want to highlight specifically what you talked about too, especially if they're interviewing multiple candidates. You want something that's going to have them be reminded of you when they read the note. You can keep it, you know, really small paragraph, you know, maybe four to six sentences. Um, you then, you know, once again, thank them for their time, say you can provide any additional information um, if they need it, and say you look forward to hearing from them soon. Send it off. Goodbye. Yeah, you can say, I usually do, I usually, for myself, one of the ones I've done, I've actually put the position title, the organization name, and then like, thank you. So it's a longer subject line, but for me, it also helps me keep organized about who I'm sending the thank you notes to, especially if I'm following up or maybe adapting some of the same language if I use them, because you know we don't want you necessarily to be writing from scratch every single time if you're hopefully going on a lot of different experience interviews. Um, so you can kind of adapt, you know, make it like a little template for yourself, and then just make sure you're not like reforwarding the right wrong thing to the wrong person. Yes. Yeah. Or multiple interviews.
Mm -hmm. Do you send an email to each member of each yeah. panelist? Do you have the same panelist? Yes, I would, I, those, then I adapt that because that person may have asked you a different question. Those people all may be representing a different kind of aspect. One might be an HR person, one might be a colleague of yours that will be the same level, one might be a supervisor. Each of those people are gonna bring something a little bit different. And then also, if you have it, it's actually easier when you're like meeting with multiple people throughout the day, because then those obviously should definitely be different because you'll have had different conversations with those people. Um, follow up, this goes back to asking the next steps, this is where we really want you to be able to say, okay, you gave me a timeline, you haven't met your timeline, let's talk about what the next steps are. This will be after, so say if you don't hear back from them, say if they say we'll let you know by Friday, um, and they don't get back to you, and then you know you want to say, this is what I can do. I'm sorry, yeah, you, you only want to send like maybe one or two. We're not saying like five, you don't want to be emailing them every week. Um, because then that they're going to start to get a negative kind of response to you, no matter how good your interview went. Because you also have to remember, too, people who interview for a living, it's also not the only thing that they do. So it's the most important thing to you in this moment, as it should be. It may or may not be the most important thing to the person who interviewed you. It doesn't mean that they're not invested in finding a good person, but it also means that they're trying to do their other job in addition to having to hire new caseworkers and things like that. This is just proper protocol. I mean, you don't want to be, like I said, you don't want to be the person who doesn't send a thank you note. I would much rather read it and have, you know, be able to go back because we've definitely had people come in to us and say, I didn't send a thank you note. They didn't get the job, no matter how many people they were interviewing. Because it's also still t thanking someone for taking the time to interview. They didn't have to interview you. Like, they didn't have to do you that favor. Because once again, it goes back to the fact of, it's you who's looking for the job, not necessarily them. So you want to be respectful and professional to them because these may be people that you may end up having a long-term you know, partnership with. All right, so job search tips. Um, golden rules, basically, to go over. It's a, it's, it is, you know, patience is a virtue. You, unfortunately, will not end up with a job probably as quickly as you think. Um, and I apologize for that, but you know, it's kind of the way of the world um, in terms of that. It is a process. It's called the job process for a reason, because you're sending applications, you're finding opportunities, you're going on interviews. Nothing ever happens as quickly as we all want it to. So I encourage you, when you start this process, wherever you may start it, say, you know, it's not gonna happen within a week. It goes back to the same thing about follow-up notes. Um, is that most people are going to be searching for opportunities and it's going to take a little bit um, of a process to figure that out. So you also want to figure out continued career exploration. Because you're in this program, you may figure out what types of patients you want to be working with, what types of treatment you want to be doing, what type of facility you may be wanting to be a part of. That may be very different when you started the program, to the middle of the program, to the end of the program. So continue to evaluate where you are as a social work professional to be able to figure out what's going to be the best opportunity for you when you finish the program and are ready maybe to secure that first full-time um, position. So that goes into developing your focus. That's going to change. Because at the beginning, you may have known nothing. Now, hopefully, you know something. At the end, we're going to hope you get a certification out of it where you're going to say that, yes, you are an accredited professional in this field. So your skill set will begin to deepen and develop as you go through the particular program. Follow through, follow through, follow through. Perfect example, I had a student in my office last spring, had applied to like 20 jobs, didn't send anybody any follow-up emails, thought that everybody was going to come to her. Surprise, surprise, nobody sends any follow-up emails. Employers are the worst. What, if you learn one thing from today's presentation, everybody you think that's going to follow up with you probably will not. But this student, I said, send some follow-up emails to the you know, internships that you really want to be a part of. This student then followed up, got two offers, and is now interning at the United Nations. Not a bad place to intern. Maybe not the best for social workers, but the concept is the same. You are the one who wants the position. The onus is on you to be able to outreach to them and say, hi, I'm still here. Submitted my application a couple weeks ago. I really want to work at your facility. I think this would be a great experience for me, and I've got all of the things that you want me to be able to do. Let me tell you. Questions you're applying for, go and look on their website. Look at where their human resources are. There's probably going to be phone numbers. There's going to be um, emails. In many cases, they aren't going to be giving out like a ton of contact information because then they know students are going to be following up. But if it's a position that you're really interested in and you're going to write a good follow-up email or phone call that says, 
I'm still here, I'm really interested in your position, let me tell you again why I wanna be in here. You may or may not hear back from them, but at least you know you've put yourself out in a professional way to say, this is why you should look at my staff. Yes? Um, if I get rejected by uh, employer, mm -hmm. say, unfortunately I cannot be rejected yeah. uh, do I respond to that? Or? You can definitely respond to that. You can say, thank you very much for considering my application. Some students will ask for feedback about why they weren't. It may be you know, that maybe you don't have the amount of experience that they're looking for, the type of, of clinical experiences. Um, some, some people will write back to you, some won't, but you, always, you also never know down the line. You may be reapplying to a full-time position at that. So you always want to appear professional, even if it's not great, a great outcome. Yeah, you can say, if you don't mind, would you mind sharing any feedback about what I can make, what I can do to make my application stronger for additional opportunities? And then, you know, you wish, wish them the best of luck on their search. In many cases, when students are rejected from opportunities, it has actually very little to do with you, and it has to do with the entire applicant pool, which obviously you don't have access to see. So it could be, you know, maybe someone had, you know, a higher GPA or had one additional practical experience because maybe you're a new student and that's just what they needed in order to be successful in their organization. It doesn't mean you won't eventually get there. It might just mean for this specific position, you, someone else had a little bit more of what they needed. Okay? Um, we'll go through this pretty quickly since I know it's five minutes too. Um, different ways that you can search for opportunities. So basically the one that we really talk about is this mix and match. Um, method. So talking about different advertised opportunities. So that means looking on NYU CareerNet, um, things that the you know, student affairs um, at Silver will um, send out to you guys, stuff that your faculty members will tell you about, the MFW Career Fair, which we'll be holding here at NYU in April. Um, trust me, you'll get a ton of information about that. Uh, and then places like you know, idealist.org, above average social work services, um, different professional associations you might be interested in. All of these things probably have job boards. You can look at all of these things and start to kind of become familiar with how postings are done. Yes? Um, how early can we start applying for jobs? Full time or internship? Full time. You graduating in May? I'm graduating, yeah. So I basically say to students, you want to think about you need the credentialing. Um, so depending on when you're you know, going to be finishing the degree. So in many cases you're going to be, they want you to have an MSW in hand. Basically what you'll be looking for is like a June 1st start date. Because a lot of what happens for hiring is that it's what, it's what we call just in time hiring. And social work is definitely one of those fields. Um, because what they will say is that I'm not hiring 15 social workers in September to start in June. I'm hiring three social workers maybe in February to start in June there. So you want to actually position yourself a little closer to when you would actually be willing to work because you never know how fast the process actually might go. I usually say to students, if you're graduating in May, uh, around spring break-ish is usually like a good place to start applying to things um, because it could, you, know, you could graduate and not have a job just yet, or you may be in the process of interviewing while you're graduating. You just don't want to start too early because most of the time for positions like this, they're going to want to hire someone who can start like tomorrow. Right. So you have to kind of work on the timing. That doesn't mean that there won't be opportunities available, so you should be looking, but you may not necessarily need to be doing as much of an in-depth search as you will be closer towards graduation. So like, so January, you can start, I usually say a lot of people, yeah, because, because they know how many graduates are coming into the field, some organizations so like hospitals and things like that may have a little bit more bandwidth to post a little bit earlier. Private facilities that maybe are only going to be hiring one or two people at most, they don't need to review applications in January to June. So for them, it's, they'll hire, they might actually even post end of March, beginning of April, knowing that most universities won't finish until like mid-May. So going through, I'm just going to go through some of these um, things quickly since we are almost at the end of our time. So 70% of all of our jobs are found through networking. I will tell you every single job I have ever gotten at NYU I got because I knew somebody. Not because I'm not qualified. Ultimately, I you know, end up doing an okay job. Um, but basically, it's, it's through networking. It's through the people who are sitting in this room. It's through your faculty members. It's through the internships and clinical experiences that you um, will have because people want to refer people that they know. It's a lot more comfortable than referring a stranger because they already know who you are. They know where your experiences are. They know whether you're a good or a bad fit for those things. Um, so you really want to be kind of looking at what we call the hidden job 
um, market. So, you know, going through all the experiences are really going to be how you market yourself to those opportunities. Yes? I'm sorry? Sorry, can you? So you want to review all of your experiences, like things you may have done in your undergrad, leadership experiences, maybe you attend conferences. So you want to look at kind of all of the things that you have done and mine that pool and figure out, is there someone in there who can serve in a mentoring capacity? Or maybe somebody works that you met at a conference at an organization that you would want to work at. You know, sending them an email and saying, can we meet for coffee? Or can I pick your brain about what it's like to work here? So you want to really mine all of those experiences to be able to say, these are some of the important people, these are some of the important experiences that then can influence how I'm gonna get that next position. Um, so, building your network. This, once again, kind of goes in through what we were saying. Um, you wanna think about all the different ties that you have, all the different kind of connections that you have to organizations um, and things. Obviously, a really long list of things for new students. This is a new network that you can be mining. Um, you're meeting new people, meeting new colleagues, meeting new professionals, um, and these are all different types of things. We become you know, resources for you. What is a mentor network? The mentor network is a network that we created that people can do informational interviewing. It's not just structured for social workers. We do have some social work professionals on there at any given time. It's a pretty fluid network, but you can learn, you, know, you can reach out to them, send them an email, um, and kind of learn what it's like to be, you know, actually work in the day to day um, if you haven't gotten that information already. You would need to come into our office to sign up for it. We have like an honor code we'll make you sign. Yes? Um, is the Wasp Center available to students after they graduate? We, you are, so the way it works is that we help um, alumni who we define as recent alumni, so within one year of graduation. So if you're going to graduate within May, you basically have access to us exactly the way you have access to us right now for one calendar year after graduation. After that, we have a smaller alumni-focused team um, that will help you too, but there are other, hopefully at that point you're networking other sources as well. Um, all of that fun stuff. So online social networking, I'm gonna hope this goes without saying because this is probably the fields you guys are using even a lot more than um, some of the traditional job sites. Um, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, all of these different things can really kind of help you go through your job search, learn more about organizations and opportunities. Hopefully you all have LinkedIn profiles. I won't go into too much detail in this because it can be very specific to each individual. But if you have any questions, we can help you evaluate this. So we do um, LinkedIn evaluations as well. Um, you know, different examples of things that you can put on here. This is where you can even be a little bit more detailed about honors and awards that you've received. Maybe not as much space because the beautiful thing about LinkedIn is that eh, you don't ever really run out of space. Um, so you can do things like that. And then different groups that you can join. Um, we've got, you know, student and alumni career connections that you can participate in. A lot of social work alumni are within that so you can see where some of your colleagues, both, you know, former and current may be, may be going and what they might be doing. So we'll go through this a little bit quickly. LinkedIn University, so different alumni, like I said, you can find out where your, some of your peers are going to be. Um, and then once again, we read it. Networking is a process. It takes some time. You know, it's not going to really happen overnight because you are creating connections um, with people. And it's really about networking and, and mining those connections in order to find the opportunities that are going to be best for you. Last, stay realistic. This is really kind of what it comes down to. It's a process. It can be really discouraging and it can be really tough. And in this field, it can be specifically tough because you guys are being trained to do something very, very specific. Um, but don't become discouraged. You know, you want to make sure you're taking advantage of all of the different opportunities that are available to you. If you ever have questions, if you ever feel like you just need to kind of talk to someone about what's going on, whether it's someone here at Silver or whether it's one of us at the Wasserman Center, we are definitely here to help. So thank you guys very much. Have a good afternoon.